Hello, my name is Ruben Major. I'm an instructor, program director for Arizona, and chief executive officer for EMS University. In this particular PowerPoint, we're going to be going over spinal motion restriction. Uh, SMR protocols are new in some areas and they are old in others. Uh, in this particular uh, sequence, you will see information related mainly to uh, protocols that are happening in Arizona. However, this is something that is, in, that is in use in other areas and also based off of solid data. Uh, the reason why we provide this information in addition to the standard chapter on head and uh, neck trauma as well as spinal trauma is because there are such different guidelines with regard to how spinal precautions are taken. So let's go ahead and get started. The objectives in this particular section are to give you a historical perspective of how things have worked in the past as far as uh, spinal, uh, spinal immobilization and then to understand injury based on biomechanical principles. Uh, we're doing research based uh, protocols meaning that the practices that we are uh, implementing are based off of current guidelines and research. So EMS is a uh, changing field and there's a lot of things that are going on now that um, are improving the way that we deliver patient care. And this is part of the reason for, uh, again, this particular th um, change in protocol. If you, you guys um, are, uh, if this is new to you, um, this, this would be, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing this in some places. Again, you know, always check with your lo local protocol to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Um, but this is the, uh, this is new medicine based on good guidelines and uh, research. So you're going to learn spinal motion restriction concepts too. From a historical perspective, you know, for the past 30 years, EMS providers have basically, you know, they've, they've gone through and, and done what it's said to do as far as the, um, you know, textbook mechanism of injury process. You know, whatever happened to the vehicle, how far, far the person fall, uh, mechanism basically over, uh, was overemphasized and it, it essentially trumped a patient interview and physical exam. In 2005, a major review article stated that uh, Historically, it is estimated that up to 25% of SCI may be aggravated at the initial insult, either during transport or um, early in the course of treatment. So, you know, th this data is more than 20 years old and there's no data available from actual studies. And careful movement of the appropriate extrication techniques are crucial in all trauma patients with spinal cord injury. So. Um, or, or also in mechanism of injury with the potential to cause spinal injury and SCI. Uh, mobilization of the entire spine is a management priority and should be undertaken in a systematic fa fashion. So because of this mindset and based on outdated unproven theory, uh, some have used spinal immobilization as a replacement for a thorough exam, thinking that, you know, basically they're going to cover themselves well simultaneously attempting to reduce the work for themselves. So, you know, this has resulted in a lot of complacency. You know, as providers, we need to make sure that we're actually giving an uh, active exam. And you'll see, uh, you know, in, in the companion videos and, uh, you know, some of the scenarios that, you know, we really are emphasizing more of a, the physical exam process in the decision-making for the patient's care. Um, again, uh, the historical perspective has been if we thought that there could have possibly have been an issue, we're going to immobilize, you know, uh, where we, you know, if we had uh, trauma above the clavicles, we would immobilize. If we weren't sure, we'd immobilize. <laughs> if we were afraid that, you know, uh, we would be punished, we would immobilize. And if we didn't feel like checking, we would immobilize. And so, you know, part of the problem here has, has also been that there have been many providers who have... Um, you know, lost their jobs and, and they've, you know, been disciplined for not immobilizing. So, you know, this kind of attitude has really prevailed in the, the industry for a long time now. And so, you know, um, unfortunately, the research shows that 
we were doing things we probably shouldn't have been doing and disciplining for things we probably shouldn't have been. Um, so in this case, things are changing and, and there are some improvements that, that are going to be made and we'll be discussing those. So how bad is it and how bad have you know, we been as providers? Well, basically greater than 50% of trauma patients with no complaint of back or neck get full spinal immobilization. And about 13% of them get mobilized without even being asked about their pain. So this is very concerning. And, you know, the facts don't really help us out very much. One to five million EMS patients per year with a suspected uh, cervical spinal injury are immobilized. And only 2% have a fracture. Only 1% develop neurodeficits. So just think about how many people are being, uh, you know, forced into this spinal immobilization that don't need it. And that's a big part of the problem. And again, why do we do it? Well, to avoid further patient injury caused, uh, or uh, excuse me, why is the reason why we're doing this? Well, to avoid further patient injury caused by us during movement and transport. So, again, apologize for that. Uh, you know, we want to focus on stopping the gross visible spinal movement. And, you know, our patient packaging stops the movement. If there's no movement, the spine, the cord, and the, the patient are safer, right? Well, you know, the, the generally accepted theory is that, you know, neurologically, we really need to start considering, um, you know, the movement. And we, we worry about, you know, movement causing the injured side to get worse in unstable segments or sharp bony fragments to cut the cord. Uh, you know, this is, this is kind of more of that evidence-based medicine. We know this to be true because we designed studies to prove it out there. Well, in 2001, a group of medical researchers performed these uh, studies, and as a result, um, they each asked the same or similar research question. The researchers looked at all the studies around the world and all the effects of spinal mobilization, including mobilizing versus not mobilizing, and mortality, neurologic disability, spinal stability, and uh, negative effects on trauma patients. Uh, they then tried to find any highly or high qualified randomized or quality randomized uh, control trials on these subjects, but you know there wasn't anything that was actually found. So, you know, the large analysis of the situation is that the effect on mortality, neuro neurologic injury, uh, spinal st uh, instabil instability, all of this stuff is uncertain. And this is not good medicine. The possibility that immobilization might actually uh, increase mortality and morbidity cannot be excluded. And how many times have providers probably caused or accentuated uh, spinal injury in the patient. Um, here's a study that was done um, by UNM, and uh, it basically said that there was uh, that there was less than a two percent chance that any immobilization has a beneficial effect. And here you can see the highlighted area. It says out of hospital immobilization has little or no effect on neurologic outcome in patients with blunt spinal injuries. And there it is, that's kind of the death knell for us. So, you know, we really need to start refining what we're doing. And that's kind of the entire idea of, of what we're doing here with this uh, new SMR protocols. What really matters? Well, visible movement is only one threat. You know, what about pulmonary function compromise or, you know, the risk of aspiration, airway compromise, you know, increased intracranial pressure, delays in transport, concealment of other injuries, you know, all the stuff that's on here. Um, you know, w what about all these other threats that are listed here? You know, this, m this list is made up of all the threats to your patients that have actually been proven to occur when you apply spinal immobilization to a patient. Remember that only 2% of these patients will have spine uh, fractures and only 1% develop neurodeficits. Is it okay to subject the other 98% of these patients to all of these potential complications? Probably not. As far as the column in the, corn, uh, the cord is concerned, 
you know, the spinal cord has is a very complex structure. Um, you know, it's it's held together in a very uh, particular manner. Um, you know, these components fail um, if we have a type of trauma. You know, where we're having an issue with spinal compromise, um, and we can make it worse by, you know messing it up by moving the patient around. So um, really, a significant amount of force is needed to break the bone and tear ligament, though. And, uh, you know, subsequent movement by EMS is less uh, than the force required to cause damage. Uh, you know, we really, really want to be careful with what we're doing with these patients. It takes a significant force to produce component failure in the spine. And, you know, specifically, it takes about six or 2,000 to uh, 6,000 newtons of force fracture uh, to fracture the cervical spine. That's a lot. So, you know, if, if we were going to compare that, uh, that's like hanging a four kilogram head off the end of a treatment table. And that generates about 40 newtons. So if you can just kind of, you know, get the idea there of the... Uh, of the relation. And the subsequent force and energy uh, deposition produced by EMS movements is several orders of magnitude less than the force required to cause new damage or worsen pre existing damage. Uh, because of this, experts argue that core damage occurs only at the time of initial impact. And the energy uh, deposition during emergency treatment and extrication after impact that we try to prevent using spinal immobilization are not sufficient to cause more injury. The movement of the column and cord. Now the normal range of motion is equal to um, you know, non-destructive distortion. So movement within the normal range requires almost no en energy at all. And resistance to the movement within the normal range is essentially zero. There's no such thing as less than zero. Uh, resistance to movement is generally greater in the injured segments of the spine. As the swelling increases, um, you know, you also have issues with preload on intact ligaments. So what's happening in this case is you're, you know, you're kind of starting to have a locking and uh, normal patients will actually self-splint to avoid that pain caused by that increased swelling. Um, you know, the bottom line is that it's only when the normal range of motion is exceeded that excess energy can cause tissue destruction at the damaged spinal segments and unwanted force is applied to the injury site. Uh, you know, generally speaking, when it comes to trauma, we really need to consider um, tissue hypoxia, direct contusion, and biochemical cascade, which results in cell death. Um, all of this is important when we're considering the column and cord. Post-injury deterioration is mitigated by getting definitive care fast. We want to get them to the hospital as soon as possible. And a lot of times when we're sitting there doing uh, spinal immobilization, it actually ends up taking longer to get to the, pa the patient to the hospital because we're spending so much time trying to, you know, put them on a backboard. And, you know, I if we do, again, have this patient where we're giving unnecessarily uh, packaging them up you know it really is a it really possibly could be a delay in care and if there's other issues going on with the patient that aren't being taken care of that can create additional problems for them and we already talked about what they were so in summary just to hit the high points you know we immobilize way too many patients um, most injured patients will become uh, mechanically stable and or actually will actually be mechanically stable. Sorry, they're not going to become. Uh, and totally unstable patients probably have maximum damage at the time of the impact. So, you know, all immobilized patients can be potentially harmed. So when we immobilize, we really need to be careful about the reasons why we're doing it. We need to think about what we're doing when we do it. Um, you know, spinal immobilization is a method of transport. It isn't a therapy. 
it's not a misnomer you know just say no to ta standing takedowns and you know when you take a look at these videos that are associated with this uh, particular lecture you'll see the reasons and the data why we're having issues with um, you know the standing takedown this is probably one of the most damaging things that we can do to the patient standard decrication techniques by the EMS personnel can cause up to four times more cervical spinal movement than controlled self extrication by the patient think about that it's just nonsense and you know this whole thing about just to be safe well you know it isn't really safe to you know put the patient in spinal immobilization we can't justify an intervention that we know to do some harm just for the possibility of benefit you know this is just simply a uh, risk of benefit decision we don't know of any spinal mobilization techniques um, that we don't actually know for sure that these spinal immobilization techniques help think about that but we've proven that it hurts and in several ways you can't just mindlessly apply an intervention that is known to do harm when the chance of benefit is theoretical at the best how does it hurt well cervical collars hurt they're proven to increase intracranial pressure they produce axial distraction force transfer force to ends obscure neck injuries make airway management difficult and I know that if you've been in the field for a while you've seen these cervical collars making um, airway management very very difficult especially for your ALS partners and just kind of a gee whiz thing for you you know there's there's specifically here a rise um, you know in distortion of from venous drainage in the neck so you know just kind of understand there's some other things going on there also rigid backboards you know they hurt they can they can cause pain and a uh, 15 to 20 percent reduction in respiratory capacity so you know if you think back to these patients if you've been um, doing a lot of spinal spinal immobilization you know how many patients did you have that were having issues with you know their their respiratory drive as soon as you put them on a backboard and and uh, you know that's just something to think about well this is this could be possibly causing an issue it also definitely does cause a delay in transport and then you know for various reasons possible risk of uh, pressure ulcers you know probably somewhat unlikely but you know there is a risk and then backboards now backboards are still reasonable in certain cases when we have blunt trauma with altered level of consciousness so you know is the patient not acting appropriately you know we're really truly thinking there there is a neurological issue here uh, spine pain and tenderness again a neurological uh, complaint and uh, anatomic deformity of the spine so we can actually look at it and see that there's a problem or we can feel it and see that there's an issue and high energy mechanisms with altered level of consciousness distracting energies uh, injuries and an inability to communicate again altered level of consciousness altered level of consciousness we can see it in ex an extremely or high energy mechanism um, with ALOC how does it hurt well penetrating trauma victims um, you know it's only 30 patients um, in, in a study that was done uh, they found mortality to be high, uh, twice as high in an immobilized group compared to those who weren't immobilized. So 30 patients, or 0.01%, had an incomplete cord in their, uh, injury and needed operative spine fixation. The number was needed to treat with spinal immobilization to potentially benefit one patient is 1,032. The number of patients needed to harm with spinal immobilization to potentially contribute was 1 to 66, or uh, contribute to one death was 1 in 66, uh, so, or was 66, excuse me. So just think about the amount of damage that you can do. And how does it hurt? Well, you know, the time zero myth, 
Uh, patient evaluation and treatment does not begin at the exact time of arrival to the emergency department. Um, you know, it, it begins at the very beginning when you see the patient. So what are the recommendations based on SMR uh, protocols? Well, the, the recommendations are to allow EMS to selectively immobilize based off of these protocols and to allow EMS to use the least amount of package needed for safe transport. Monitor the outcomes. Empowering EMS is so important. Several studies show that EMS is actually capable, believe it or not, of deciding whether or not to do spinal immobilization. Of the studies showing that EMS is capable of selectively immobilizing patients safely, the few patients that were found with missed injuries were because of protocol violations or extremes of, er, extrem extremes of age, so elderly and very young. And we'll just briefly talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, basically, if we take a look at this protocol, and again, uh, you know, there's a sample protocol that's attached. We have certain guidelines, and I'm going to try to, I'll bring these up here. Apologize if you can't completely see this on your screen. I'll try to get it on here for you. Okay, and I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of walk you through this here really briefly. So, uh, you know, we're going to start right here, and this is the question. Do we have a poten pen, uh, potential mechanism of injury for an unstable spinal injury? Okay, yes, there is a potential mechanism. So this is where we start with everything. And again, this is for adults that are greater than or equal to 15 years of old or 15 years of age with uh, uh, blunt trauma. Altered level of consciousness. So is there an altered level of consciousness? Is the Glasgow Coma Scale um, less than 15? Is there an unreliable interaction? Well, if no, if not, do we have any spinal pain or tenderness or anatomical deformity of the spine or neurological deficits? You know, is the patient not able to answer any questions appropriately? Again, we're kind of duplicating here. But we really want to just rule that out because, you know, when, whenever we have issues with uh, the spinal cord, you know, there's possi a high possibility or high index that there may be an issue with you know uh, neurological so that's the idea and again if it says no then in this case you're going to omit uh, SMR now I'm going to scroll back up a little bit I might look this might look a little bit weird to you and again these are uh, Arizona Emergency Medical Services protocols um, but you know again check your own protocols to see what those might be for you um, this is just kind of a sampling of the SMR on our side so if, it, if there's any yes here, you're going to want to uh, possibly uh, uh, apply, or excuse me, uh, possible, there's a possible spinal injury, then you apply SMR. So, but again, this is with a Glasgow Coma Scale uh, of less than 15, and then, you know, we possibly might be having some neurological issues. And, and yes, then, you know, for any of these things right here, if there's spinal pain or tenderness, or do we see any issues again, you know, we're going to want to apply the spinal motion restriction. So always, obviously, either you're looking at uh, mental or uh, mental issues, um, mentation or level of consciousness issues, rather, and then you're also looking at, you know, what you can see and feel in your uh, diagnostic examination. And then there's some just kind of general information right here in the protocol tree, uh, which you'll see that's kind of in the gray box areas. And you can read this on your own as well. Um, but I did want to just kind of bring up to you really briefly that there are high characteristics and then low risk characteristics. So in, in the uh, high risk characteristic mechanisms, uh, you know, if we have a patient that is over 65 years of age, or there's a trauma tr uh, criteria based on mechanism, which, you know, we're talking, you know, extreme mechanism. Um, and you can, you can watch the other videos to see and protocols to see exactly what those, those might be. Um, or axial loads or, you know, diving injuries, sudden acceleration, deceleration, 
lateral bending forces of the neck and torso, violent impact of the head, neck, and torso, pelvis, numbness, tingling, para uh, parathesis, then if any of these above, then you're going to strongly consider SMR. But again, this protocol is leaving it to the discretion of the EMS provider to figure out what exactly is going to be the most appropriate. And you know, when we talk about doing the exam, the neurological exam or the motor sensory exam um, and the motor sensory exam, uh, for the neurological exam, obviously, you know, um, we're going to be looking at, you know, can they answer the questions appropriately, which we've been over in the patient assessment section, if you've looked at that. Um, and then uh, for the motor sensory part, we want wrist hand extension bilaterally, and that's just because that's going to cover uh, additional areas of the spine that, you know, say we're just not looking at, um, you know, foot plantar flexion or, you know, whether or not you can squeeze the palms, but also we want it to travel a little bit higher up the spine so we can see if there's an issue. Um, yeah, you know, and then also consider the unreliable patient interactions, you know, where you might have issues with language barriers, is there, you know, lack of cooperation in the exam, is there evidence of any drug or uh, alcohol intoxication? And uh, is, are there any painful distracting injuries such as long bone fractures? So that also we need to discuss the low risk mechanisms. So these are cases where, you know, it's probably highly likely that you're not going to be uh, doing the spinal motion restriction. In, in these cases, we're talking simple rear-end collisions, if their patient's walking around on scene when you get out there at any time, you know, there's no neck pain on the scene, scene no midline cervical tenderness. But again, these protocols are not necessarily rigid. They're, you know, f for you to take into consideration like you would any other diagnostic tool. So, you know, we need to treat the entire patient and not just, you know, one set of you know, or one particular criteria. So let's go ahead and get back to the video, or back to the lecture. Okay. And, you know, again, we talked about these, uh, these step three criteria in that particular protocol, and I'm just going to read them off very briefly for you in case you can't see them. Uh, ejection, partial or complete from automobile, obviously, you know, that's going to be a problem. A uh, motorcycle crash where they're going over 20 miles an hour. Patients ran over with significant impact over 20 miles an hour. And again, I would say, you know, here's the thing. If the patients ran over, you know, maybe, you know, you may want to consider that the injuries can be even worse because just just being ran over is can be an extremely traumatic event. For falls, adults uh, greater than 20 feet one story uh, is equal to about 10 feet. So this is a little bit higher than we, you know, had had previously used. And then children uh, greater than 10 feet or two to three times the height of the child. High risk auto crashes um, and then, you know, including uh, roof uh, with uh, greater than 12 inches of the occupant or greater than uh, one or 1.8 or 18 inches in a side. So this is we're talking intrusion here, sorry. Um, and then death of the passenger, passenger compartment. So basically high, high mechanism of injury probabilities here. Auto versus pedestrian bicycles not ran over or thrown with less than 20 miles per hour of impact. Uh, for penetrating trauma, we're going through the same de decision tree here. Um, but, you know, really what we're looking at on penetrating trauma is, is there a neuro neurological deficit? If there are neurological problems, then, you know, yes, we're going to want to do SMR. If not, then no. But again, this is the same similar idea that we've been presenting across the entire protocol tree. And then uh, for blunt trauma here, if we have a high risk of motor vehicle collision, rollover, head-on collision, you know, death in the vehicle, speed greater than 55 miles an hour. So... And this is for pediatrics. I apologize, I didn't mention that before. So for pediatrics. And these are the high risk characteristic mechanisms for pediatrics. Um, you know, also make sure you're checking the, ex you're doing the exam too. And, you know, checking for full range of motion in, in, a pedi in the pediatric patient. You know, if, if the patient does not show voluntary range of motion, you should you should actually apply SMR. It's not necessarily true for adults, though. So it's a little bit different here. Um, 
and the low risk mechanisms are going to be you know fairly similar to what is in here but there's no medical evidence again um, I apologize for that disregard that the low risk uh, characteristic or mechanisms are not included in here because peds um, there is no medical evidence to verify the accuracy in children so um, no studies uh, same thing for penetrating trauma for peds as for adults you know same idea here what is the what is the neurological you know issue is is there a neurological issue you know if there is then you know we're going to apply the smr if not we don't and also again remember is there something you can see uh, or is there something you can feel if so then you know that can create an impossible issue backwards are still reasonable for blunt trauma with altered level of consciousness there it is again spine pain uh, pain tenderness and neuro complaint there it is again anatomical deformity of the spine so again can you see it can you feel it and uh, high energy mechanisms with altered level of consciousness distracting injury and ability to communicate so what about the equipment what should we be using well uh, you know uh, to be honest with you the scoop stretcher is the best thing that to use for us uh, for the uh, for these types of injuries they are the same or superior than the log roll and lift and side techniques. So the Kendrick, Kendrick devices, shortboards, what about those? Well, self-extrication with a collar might be better, but only for normal, reliable patients. And just kind of, what about the equipment here? Well, conventional extrication techniques record up to four times more cervical spinal movement during extrication during self uh, controlled self extrication so again remember we talked about how we can cause further damage if we're not careful what about the equipment backboards are like spatulas at some point the burger has to be put on a bun um, you know backboards are an extrication tool they are not medical treatment SMR outweighs the known risks and associated with the procedures and equipment this selective spinal motion recession algorithm is a screening tool derived from widely accepted medical research, current practice, and expert consensus. It is designed to identify a subset of patients that may be safely transported to the emergency department for definitive evaluation without application of certain spinal immobilization equipment. The algorithm does not constitute clearing of the spine. So the procedure is to follow our acceptable methods of tools and uh, achieving uh, that achieve the spinal motion restriction. The list is arranged from least invasive to the most uh, invasive. So here we go. Fowlers, semi-fowlers, or supine position are on the gurney with cervical collar only. Supine position with vacuum uh, mattress device splinting from head to toe. Uh, child car seat with appropriate supplemental padding. The spinal positioning on the scoop stretcher secured to a strap system and appropriately padded including head blocks avoiding log roll movements adds benefit and spine positioning uh, supine positioning with long backboard secured with strap system and appropriate padding includes head blocks backboards again still reasonable for blunt trauma and again we I think we just looked at this slide so I'm just going to skip it Here's some other procedures. If you guys want to go ahead and pause the video, you can take a look at this. And here's the pre-hospital trauma life support recommendation. Again, you can pause this and take a look at it if you'd like. It's the same idea as the uh, previous protocol slides that we've, we've gone over before. Here's a little bit more of it. So emergency department transfer of care is helpful to discuss the emergency department, why you decided to package or not package the patient. Share the information. Share your decision-making process. Why did you do this? Why did you not do it? Patient packaging no longer uh, a contextual clue uh, to guide radiography needs. So just because they're on a uh, you know, board does not necessarily mean that they are going to be x-raying them now this may change in the future because you know if we do reevaluate um, the way that we are providing spinal motion restriction in the field 
then the people in the hospital will need to be reevaluating what they're going to be doing as far as the radiographic exam. In interfacility transports or uh, transfers, the medical directors need to reconsider their protocols. How is the first hospital clearing? And uh, you know, the crew should independently examine patients. So you know, once you get the patient in the ambulance, um, and even before, you should be trying to evaluate exactly how you're going to be uh, treating this particular patient. Should you be, um, you know, putting them on a backboard or not? You know, always redo your assessment. Collar, is it reasonable? But, you know, a long backboard, is this, you know, appropriate care? Very important for us to do this. And again, always make sure that you follow your local protocol. You guys will have a chance to take a look at the video. And here's the credits for this particular, um, for this particular presentation. And thank you for listening to this lecture.